Okay, I think we're just about to start. So um, I'm going to start off the proceedings. I think I'm going to share my screen. Let me see now. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. You are very, very welcome to our annual conference of the UCD Child Research Center. My name is Orla Doyle. I'm an associate professor in the School of Economics. And I'm also the current director of the center. So we really are delighted that we got a, the opportunity to have the, cent have the conference this year, even though it is virtual, but we're all used to that at this stage. Um, before we kick off, I'd just like to give you some information about the center because just uh, some of you may be less familiar with the center than others, because um, I know we have quite a wide audience today. So the center was created in 2013 to facilitate collaboration among the biopsychosocial disciplines within UCD and a specific aim to reach a support interdisciplinary collaborations, to train early stage researchers, and to really showcase the strengths of UCD in this area of children's research. Um, we have about 40 faculty members and about 23 early stage um, researchers as part of the centre across both the social sciences and the health sciences. So our members come from lots of different schools in economics or in economics, lots of different schools in UCD from economics, psychology, education, social policy, geography, public health, nursing, medicine and agriculture and food sciences. And we're always trying to increase our list. So if you are from another school and you'd like to join, please join up. Uh, since 2017, um, Centre members have published 443 journal articles and have generated about 8 million euros worth of funding, so you are all a very productive lot. In terms of governance, the, the Centre is housed in the UCD Geary Institute for Public Policy, so I'd particularly like to thank Philip um, O'Connell, the Director of Geary's, for supporting us. Um, the home school is, is rotated based on the affiliation of the directors, so that means the current home school is the School of Economics, so I'd like to thank the head of the School of Economics, Professor Ron Davies, for that. Um, the centre is governed by an executive committee um, with representatives from the College of Social Science and Law and also the College of um, Health and Agricultural Sciences. And um, current executive committee members include Professor Eilish Hennessy, Dr. Suja Samaladam, Dr. Afrik O'Sullivan, and Professor Fanula McAuliffe. So I'd like to thank Eilish, Suja, Afrik, and uh, Fanula for helping with today's conference and for making it happen. And you're going to be hearing from them all throughout the morning. Uh, we do a number of different activities in the center. Every summer, we have our early stage researcher summer seminar series. It didn't happen this year for COVID related reasons, but we will be having that back again next summer. And obviously every year we have our annual conference. We generally have it around this time of the year. So we're, we're as I said, we're happy that it could go ahead this year. We also hold training workshops for early stage researchers. We have had workshops on ethics and on SPSS, and we plan to do more of those over the coming years too. Sporadically, we do host academic seminars as well. And then I think it was about a year or so ago, we have st we started to engage in a lot more outreach activities. So we had a range of parenting seminars that were open to the public and they were really, really, really successful. People always want to know how to become a better parent. Um, just last week, we had to submit a review report to the Academic Council for Academic Centres. And this was a really good opportunity for us to really try to define what the center is going to do for the next couple of years. So we conducted a, a survey of all our members. So thank you for completing that if you did. And this has really helped us um, set out what are the objectives for the next few years. So based on the feedback, our objectives are firstly to improve networking opportunities through our activities and our events. Um, we also want to actively build collaboration among center members. We want to better disseminate centre members' research outputs. We want the centre to have better engagement with policymakers. And finally, we want to identify specific research areas which the centre is going to champion and help develop. And how are we going to do this? We need some activities. Um, one of the things we're going to start doing more is publicising and celebrating our members' achievements by tweeting, emailing, putting it on our website about new publications, new working papers, funding awards, PhD completion. So if you are a member and you do something good, please let us know and we'll publicize that for you. 
We also intend to initiate a monthly lunch and learn seminar series where we have one academic and one policymaker or practitioner present on the same topic. We did actually initiate this last January, but then COVID interrupted. So we're gonna start that again. We also plan on building relationships with other children's research networks, both in Ireland and more internationally. We are also for the first time going to initiate what we're calling an internal review service. And this is where um, centre members can basically submit their funding applications or their promotions applications before they submit them. And then other centre members will review them and provide feedback before they submit. And we are also going to speci um, select specific research areas where research member centre members have an expertise. We're then going to support and develop these specific areas through developing these cross campus working groups. And finally, we are going to improve gender diversity among our membership by, by directly targeting underrepresented groups. And those underrepresented groups for us are men. Um, all our executive committee members are female. Um, most of our members are female. So we really do want to um, kind of widen up our membership. So I was going to say, if you are a man, but not necessarily. If you are a man or you are a woman and you're interested in becoming a member of the center, I've put the website here. Um, so if you click on this link, you can fill out the form and apply to become a member. And that is it from me. Um, I hope the conference, you have a really great morning. I hope you enjoy the conference. If you are into Twitter, you can tweet using the following hashtag UCD child 2020. So I'm going to stop sharing this now. And I am going to introduce our first keynote speaker. So our first keynote speaker this morning is Professor uh, Ludger Voisman. He is the Professor of Economics at the University of Munich. He's also the Director of the IFO Center for the Economics of Education. Ludger is one of the world's leading educational economists, and he is particularly interested in the importance of education for economic prosperity and the effects of school systems on educational achievement and equality of education. And obviously I've known about Ludger's work for a number of years now, but we met virtually at a conference just a couple of months ago. And um, so I'm really, really pleased he agreed to come today and to open up our conference. So thank you very much Ludger for being with us today. I can't wait to hear your presentation and I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to you. So thank you. Well, thanks Ola. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, thanks most of all for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Sounds like a really uh, great, interesting center. Um, uh, and then the topics today so I'm very interesting as well. So let me share my screen um, to show you what I want to talk about. Um, so um, with, with this whole um, uh, workshop, um, it's all about how the COVID pandemic affects uh, the children. Uh, as Ola has pointed out, I am uh, an economist uh, in, in the background, but really what I'm talking about today is not so much economics in it. Uh, it's really in general social science studies of how uh, the, the COVID situation affects the children. It's joint work with several other people in, in, in my center. Um, and the background really is that we had these big school closures uh, and, and for a while we had no idea what was really going on uh, with the children. I mean, everybody has his own surroundings and can observe something, but if there's something, I think we all learn from uh, child research is that uh, you cannot like generalize from any person's own experiences. You really need uh, like representative data to, to get an idea of what's going on. And so we then decided we somehow want to try to do it uh, ourselves. Uh, and so we did collect data on, on what children were do, doing during the times of the school closures. Um, and we had two dimensions of inequality in our mind really when, when trying to understand what was happening. And the one is that many people talk about is by say socioeconomic background of the children. Um, but we uh, right from the start said like there's another dimension and that's really between low and high achieving uh, students if you want. So really the ones who are fast learners and slow learners or however you want to define that. And um, we had in mind that this may be a particular aspect in here and um, the data that I'm going to show you uh, in this talk really supports that. And so that's the, going to be the main uh, uh, takeaway here about how school closures affect low and high achieving students differently. So um, the, the background here, like if you think about it conceptually, 
is that like probably all of us have thought about how uh, school closures increase inequality between children from different family backgrounds, be it rich and poor families or high, low educated parents. Uh, and, and many international organizations have pointed that out that early on, many researchers have pointed that out and rightly so, I think. Um, in, in this paper, in this research, we argue there's another dimension of inequality that may be particularly important uh, for understanding how school closures affect children, and that's the one between low and high achieving students. So, like conceptually, if you think about it, it may really be low achieving students who are particularly uh, affected by the fact that there's no educator uh, in the room and, and you don't have support by, by a teacher uh, during the school closures. So, well, we economists like to call this uh, the educational production process, but it's really what everybody else also is interested in, it's just the education process. If you think about this process uh, and, and the, the situation from that perspective, the defining feature of school closures really is that uh, it induced a sharp decline in the support of trained teachers. So you didn't go to school every day, you had a teacher there uh, uh, who tries to uh, convey knowledge and understand and, uh, and see what you're doing. Um, but this was really uh, gone. Like if you're gonna see in our data, which is like from Germany, um, the, the direct contact of the students and, and all the kids with the teachers basically evaporated during the school closures. Um, and then you've got this out of school learning, learning at home, kids sit, sit at home. And this then, if there's no educator in the room, implies a large amount of self-regulated learning. So the kids must independently like acquire academic con content, must understand it. So it's so like what mostly happened in Germany is they just got worksheets uh, sent home and they were just meant to read the stuff in their school books and then solve, uh, solve the problems. This may be feasible for high achieving students to some extent because they read the book, understand it reasonably well and so can work on it. But like this self-regulated learning may be particularly challenging for low achieving students. I mean, I just think about it like they're gonna read the book, they don't understand a word. Uh, no, they need the help of a teacher, teacher is not there, they are doomed. Uh, and I think this dimension is, is, uh, uh, is really important to understand what, what COVID school closures did uh, to children. Um, it's really like ending the most important input in the schooling process, namely the, the teachers. And so we got a huge literature showing how, how important teachers are. Now, if you cut that short, it's gonna be the kids who are not as good as self-regulated learning um, who are really missing out something. I mean, the teachers generally know, like they explain it one way, then explain it the other way, talk to the kids, see why and how they don't understand it, explain it yet another way, and that's how it works. And if you don't have that, that's gonna be very hard for the low achieving students. And then if you think about skill formation in general as a process of dynamic complementarity, so skills beget skills, that really means that the low achievers are the ones who have the, the least additional uh, skill accumulation here. Okay, what we're gonna do in this paper, the setting is this like three months nationwide school closures in Germany um, to like, we basically, our schools didn't have any digital learning experience really, like in any data international comparisons uh, before Corona, we, you could always see that like in school digitalization was really low in Germany. And probably like most other countries, like there was no master plan whatsoever on how to deal with pandemics, which like maybe not surprising, but that's that's the background. So in, in this situation, we, we wanted to understand what was going on. There was no publicly available data, no official data. Everybody was just speculating. And then we decided we really need to know this. And so the main feature we, that we did is like we did a detailed time use survey on what school children did during the school closures and also before the school closures. This is based on a survey of more than a thousand parents of school age children. So the, the parents uh, are gonna report on their kids, which are part of a representative survey. Uh, it was in the field during the whole month of June. Uh, and that's the main thing we're gonna have. So I, to, to be honest, of course, I would love to have uh, test score information on what kids have actually learned or maybe psychological uh, 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 measures of, of how they were doing. Uh, this was just not feasible during that time. Um, 
Uh, and by now we like there's I know a couple of studies like a nice study from the Netherlands another one from, from Belgium who, who have more information on what kids have actually learned we we are not going to have that to be clear we're just going to talk about how much time they spend on learning on the other hand actually like at the end of the day I, I, I was very happy that we did this time use study because we're going to know much more what kids did beyond learning namely what other activities did they do and that's something you generally don't have in any of these school-based or or test score based data sets and i think that's actually uh, an advantage of, of, of what we uh, can do here we also elicited uh, information about parental support and about what schools were doing and i'm going to talk about all that a little bit uh, in this talk just to to get you an idea of where we're going here's, here's the main results of what we find so if you just look at the learning time, how much time kids spend learning per day, that was basically cut in half during the school closures. It was about seven and a half hours on average for all kids before on an usual work day before Corona. And that went down to three and a half hours uh, during uh, the school closures. Um, and most importantly for my talk here, that reduction was significantly larger for low achieving students than for high achieving students. So it's really, the low achieving students who reduced their learning time during the school closures. And they mainly replaced it by activities that you may generally think are quite detrimental for school, uh, for, for, for child development, namely particularly computer gaming and anything that's related to it. This is really the time use that went up uh, tremendously. Uh, we also see a slight uh, increase in other activities that you may think are well, reasonably conducive to child development, like reading or creative activities or even physical exercise, but that's all on a very low basis. Um, uh, and again, if anything, uh, it's the high achievers that did more of it. Um, with anything that parents did during the time and schools did during the time, um, they did not do anything that really compensated this learning gap between low and high achievers. If anything, both parents and schools did more for the high achievers than for the low achievers. Um, finally, just to look at other dimensions. So we, we also, well, if you just look at the reduction in learning time between kids with high educated and lower educated parents, we don't see any significant difference in the reduction in learning time, which has really surprised us. I'm gonna to get to that a little bit in the end, uh, but here, it's really not the parental education or parental income dimension. We also have income. It's actually, if anything, the reduction is larger for kids from, from richer parents because they used to go to school more. Um, uh, the really relevant dimension here is this between low and high achievers. Another uh, dimension where we do see differences, uh, though, is, is gender. So uh, uh, boys did much less learning during the closures than girls. All right. A uh, little bit of, of institutional background here. Can I actually see that? No, don't matter. Um, so it's just like in, in most other countries, mid-March, all schools, schools were closed. Um, and, and many students lost in Germany up to 12 weeks of in-person classroom learning, which is about a third of the overall school uh, weeks of, a, of an entire school year. Um, and there was no like centralized uh, concept to implement online schooling, um, not to begin with, but also not later, still not today. Um, so all these decisions on how and what to do were really left to schools and literally to the teachers, individual teachers discretion in Germany. Uh, at the end of April, um, after lots of other things in, uh, in the economy and public services had reopened, there was a huge public debate of more priorities and literally schools were last to reopen in Germany, alas, um, and it was really slow to, to reopen. Um, we did get a partial return that was actually either based on daily shifts or mostly weekly shifts, so one half of a classroom goes to school one week, the other the other week, and the other week you're at home. But it really started just out with the graduation classes of each school, so very few students, and then it was successively expanded to other grades uh, in the second half of May and then in June. So my three kids actually went back to school uh, not before June. But all went back and we actually have pretty late summer holidays, so um, most students had a few weeks of in-person teaching before the summer break. Uh, and then after the summer break, schools reopened actually for all students, uh, in my view, luckily, um, but there's still no clear guidelines on, on, on what, what they are 
should be doing uh, if uh, schools have to close again. And we are right there right now. Several states are back into in these partial closures. Everybody's going to talk about that. School's probably going to be closed for about three weeks uh, now because we really have a huge increase in uh, infection rates in Germany over the uh, recent weeks um, and still no plan what to do with schools. OK, so what did we do? Um, in my center, we've been doing like for, I think, for seven years now. We have this uh, every year have run a, a representative a survey of the German adult population on their opinions on different parts of education policies. It's really more like an opinion survey. This year, it was fielded by a polling firm called Respondi. They did it in, in online access panels and that ran basically through, through throughout the whole month of June. Um, and we have a total sample, actually much larger than previous years, luckily, of more than 10,000 respondents, which is a representative uh, sample of the population aged 18 to 69. And now what we did for this study, we, we took the subsamples uh, of all parents of school children and in the sample turned out to be 1,099 parents. And we asked them about uh, uh, their uh, respective youngest child in school. Um, so we kind of decided we're going to have a lot of questions. It's anyway a long questionnaire. So we would rather actually ask them for just about one child and uh, we we, uh, we decided to, to take the Yamas child in this case. So um, just to be clear, this is not a, a sample drawn to be representative of parents. In that sense, it's kind of a convenient sample. But given the representative of, uh, of the underlying uh, survey for, for the adult population, uh, it really provides a super good fit uh, for uh, students in Germany. And we just like, we put it next to uh, administrative data and it looks very good. And so what we did is a number of different survey items. And what I'm mainly going to talk about is this first one. So we have survey items on the children's time use uh, during these uh, school closures during Corona. So the question was just like, what activities did your child do on a typical workday during the several weeks of Corona related school closures? And then we gave them a number of, uh, of activities and like they should actually fill in by like half hours, how many, like how long did they spend on that? And they had an open field, they could like uh, add additional uh, items there. Um, and then we asked uh, the same question again for a typical workday before Corona. So to be clear, this is represent uh, a retrospective uh, uh, information with all the problems that it may have, but at least we have some benchmark to compare uh, to see whether if we see any differences during Corona, is it something that like was there already before Corona or that actually came with Corona. And then, uh, then we had a couple of survey items on the children's school grades in math and German uh, before the school closure. So and we use that information uh, to define our sample of low and high achievers. So we just like did a simple thing. We just take the average grade in math and German of these children and uh, any child uh, whose grade is um, below the median uh, grade in the, in the respective school type, uh, we call a low achiever uh, and everybody who's at or above the median we call a high achiever. So whenever I want to talk about low high achievement here is really think about it as about the grade uh, in, in math and German of these kids and just like a sample split in half, roughly half. We actually have additional information. We actually asked parents like about the whole time use battery. We asked them about how much of the, the time that their, their kids spent on this one, how much did they spend together with their kid? So we have some idea of how, what, what parents did with their kids. Some other things about parental beliefs and, and family environments that I'm not really gonna cover here today. But we also asked parents about how schools organize the teaching during the school closures. And I'm gonna give you a quick idea of that as well. Um, well, let's skip the sample characteristics. Well, just to like, if you wanna know what, what it is, it's basically, it's like roughly one third of, uh, of the sample is in, in primary school, which in Germany is grade one to four. And then another third is in the gymnasium which is the high track secondary school. So we've got this track secondary school system and then another third or roughly is in the, the uh, lower track secondary schools. That's like, so this, this is what we're covering here. And so well, everything I'm gonna show you is an average of these. Um, and um, I think it's actually easiest to start out with like a little picture that gives you the main ideas and gives you the main results. I'm then gonna show you some statistical tests, but that's uh, uh, is, is really easily described. 
So we did ask parents like, how much time did your uh, kids spend on these different activities? And two of these activities, the first one was attending school and the second one was learning for school. And you just take, take them together as school activities. And what you can see, this is for the low achievers. Um, uh, before Corona, they spend about seven and a half hours uh, on school activities, six hours in school, and then an hour and a half learning for school. Now, during Corona, um, like this went down to, to three and a half hours, 3.4 hours really. So we had this emergency schooling for, for particularly for kids of parents in critical uh, occupations. So there's a little bit of uh, in-schooling even during the school closures. But, but this is really where it went down. Kids spend more time at home than like on, that they usually spend on homework, but not so much. It's really like, like we went down from seven and a half hours by more than four hours uh, for the low achievers. Here's the same picture for the high achievers. You can basically see that before Corona, there's no difference whatsoever between these two groups. It's nothing significant, but the reduction is actually lower for the high achievers. Um, yeah, it's a half an hour difference in, in how much time they spend learning or on school activities during Corona, which like given the baseline of, of less than three and a half hours for the low achievers is quite a, quite a substantial difference of like half an hour each and every day uh, during this time. So that's the main difference we see in terms of how they reduce school activities. So it's a big reduction for both groups, but this is even bigger for, for low achievers. Now, what did they do instead? Here's a number of activities where I'm, you can have your own views on these, but like many people would argue that these may still be conducive for child development. It's like reading or being read to, it's music and creative work, so playing music and creative work or physical exercise. And what you see is, um, well, there's already a difference between low and high achievers on this. Before Corona, that increased a little bit, but overall, all these things are on a relatively low level and the, the change over time is, uh, like they expanded a little bit, but not big time. What they really expanded big time is activities that most people would think are rather detrimental for child development. This is things like watching TV, playing computer games, spending time on social media or online media. This was already higher for the low achievers before Corona, but actually the increase is much bigger uh, for low achievers than high achievers. And if you look at that, these kids really spend 6.3 hours each and every day during the school closures on, on TV and computers compared to 3.4 hours like at the top that they spend on any uh, school activities. I mean, that's a real amazing picture, I think, on what kids actually did during the school closures. Um, okay, here's the same thing just in terms of, of uh, numbers and statistical tests. Um, let me actually make sure I can see this. Um, okay. Sorry, um, where do we start here? Um, so if you, so in the middle, we've got the, the time before Corona and you've got the low achievers, the high achievers and, and the difference. And you see the difference there is, is small and not statistically significant. Then during Corona, we actually do see this half an hour difference uh, in how much uh, time low and high achievers spend on school activities so that you can look at the difference between uh, like in, in what they did during and before, after, be between low achievers and high achievers. So it's a difference in the difference. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's this 0.4 hours that actually is statistically significant, larger reduction in learning time for low achievers than for high achievers. Um, and then like for these conducive activities, you actually see um, quite, uh, quite a difference also in these activities um, between low and high achievers, but most of that already existed before Corona. So that the change uh, in the gap is, uh, has increased, but it's only marginally significant. And then you see this huge gap in, in the detrimental activities where the low achievers do much more, uh, spend much more time on. It's about 1.4 hours, a bit more actually. About half of that actually already existed before Corona, but half of it is actually something that did uh, happen during Corona. And so, and again, these difference and the differences is statistically highly significant for the detrimental activities. So that's the, the overall picture. Now, of course, 
being a high or low achieving student is correlated with all sorts of other background things, like probably with, with the socioeconomic background, actually with gender. Uh, so we see all that. And so we have a little, like some information we do have on the kids on the background. So we know which type of school they go to. We know their age, we know their gender, whether they're a single child, we know the education level of the parent, whether it's a single parent, the, the working stages of the parent, we have household income information. And so basically we can now just estimate this, uh, this gap in, in how much time different kids spend learning between high and low achievers um, and condition on these other things, just to see how much is left after you could condition out on that. And what you basically see is that it's hardly affected by looking at these other dimensions. Um, uh, it, so it's not that the low achievers like have a large reduction learning time, whatever, because they are from low SES backgrounds, because they are boys or anything, like at most you explain or like account for 20% uh, of the high low achiever gap. And that's actually mostly because of the age and that has something to do with like at which age kids get better grades. So it's really, it seems to be mostly orthogonal to these other observables. So it, it seems to be that it's really something about the achievement levels rather than uh, anything else that is relevant here. Okay, now we, uh, as I indicated, we also asked the parents how much of these activities did you spend time together with your kid on? And so we can look at the same picture really here. And what you see, for example, on average parents said before Corona, they spent about half an hour each day learning on learning activities uh, at home with their children. There's already like some gap on that between low and high achievers. So they spend 0.2 hours more with high achievers. That increased slightly uh, during Corona to 0.3 hours. And this, this difference, uh, uh, is marginally significant, but the point is really, if anything, uh, parents spent more time with high achievers than low achievers, and if anything, that difference increased during Corona. So it's certainly not that parents compensated uh, uh, this learning difference. There's actually also some other interesting difference in the other dimensions, but let me actually uh, jump across that so we get some time for discussion. Uh, let me talk about what schools did. Um, so we asked parents like, how often did schools do the following things? And they could answer from daily to never. And this is just the share uh, that schools did on these activities uh, at least several times a week. Um, and so, and so um, what we see is actually very little online learning. Um, so shared lessons for the whole class, e.g. by video call, could, could actually even be something different. Less than 30% say that we had that at least several times a week. It's literally only 6% say it, it was on a daily basis. So hardly any school did that. More than half say they had it less than once a week. The other point, so it's low level. And the other point is, if anything, this happened more for high achievers than for low achievers. So if anything, the, the schools spend more time being uh, in contact uh, with high achievers than with low achievers. And we also asked, uh, parents, how often uh, did your child have individual contact with a teacher? And it's even less, it's really, less, really frustrating. Like hardly any teachers try to contact the, the, uh, the, the children on a regular basis. And again, if anything, it's much more for the high achievers than the low achievers. So we don't know whether this is supply or demand. It could be really like the demand from, from the low, the high achieving uh, kids that triggers that, but the upshot is the schools did nothing to compensate the learning time differences. If anything, they actually spend more time with the, with the high achievers. Um, okay, let me drop that as well. It's not so super. So, um, so this was the achievement dimension of inequality. If I quickly talk about the, the socioeconomic background uh, uh, dimension of inequality, and there, like really, like it's not that parental education is not so important, or socioeconomic background is not so important in Germany. If anything, it's really much more important than in other countries. We've seen that a lot. So here's like one picture that's well known to education people in Germany. Um, if you just look at like which share of kids go to university and do you, like do it between kids whose parents went to Germany themselves and those who didn't go to university themselves, so academic parents, non-academic parents. 79% of kids of, of academic parents go to university themselves, only 27 from, uh, of kids from uh, non-academic parents, like, like a 50 percentage point difference. So 
Parental education is super important for educational outcomes in Germany. That's what I just want to say. And then you see that in test scores and stuff like that as well, which makes it even more like um, surprising. And it was really a big surprise to us that if you like do the same table that we looked at before on achievement, now on parental academic background, like whether parents have a higher education or not, the reduction in learning time is not statistically significantly different between the two groups. So it's really kids from academic parents lost as much learning time as kids from non-academic parents. Um, so here, so we don't know about quality time. They may actually learn more during that time. We couldn't say with our data, but at least in terms of the learning time, uh, this is not the relevant uh, dimension. Um, and as I indicated, I think I, I have to hurry up here. Uh, the reduction in learning time is actually significantly larger for boys than for girls. So girls seems to be like have at least fared a little bit better with the homeschooling than, than the boys. It's really, again, a half an hour difference here. Um, let me skip uh, the other details, maybe some of you. So we did ask parents to what extent the whole situation was a psychological burden for the child and for themselves. And it's a, it's a bit more than, than a third say it was a big uh, psychological burden. It's actually, so majority says it wasn't. Um, and it's actually not significantly different between low and high achieving children. Um, we also asked them whether they argued more during the school closures than beforehand with their child. And there's a, like a marginally significant difference to the extent that it's 30% for low achieving kids and 24 for high achieving kids. But all these are actually aren't, aren't super large, I think. Um, um, let me repeat that, like, like, what are the limitations or what we can take away from this year? So we do measure learning time. We have no measures of acquired knowledge and skills. But in this, like, achievement dimension between low and high achievers, I think we can be pretty sure that what I've shown you is something like a lower bound because high achievers are arguably the more effective time users and they're actually going to be learning more during each hour uh, than the low achievers. And there's a lot of service specific challenges that many of you may have in mind by now. We hopefully can discuss that afterwards. I, I think I should wrap up. So things like social desirability bias or recall bias, um, parents' knowledge of what kids are actually doing, of survey fatigue, all these things are things we should be discussing. But I think there's actually good hints in our data that none of this is really like a big deal in what we're doing. And we, we can get back to that if you want. Um, okay, here's, here's my concluding slide. Um, we think that an important dimension of inequality that is relevant when you look at school closures is the one between low and high achieving students. It's gonna be the low achievers who are uh, particularly hurt by the lack of having teacher support uh, uh, in the classroom and self-regulated self learning may just be too challenging for them. And so we do see that the low achievers reduce their learning time significantly more than high achievers in our setting, and they're particularly replaced it by detrimental activities like computer gaming. Um, and, and this learning gap between low and high achievers is not compensated by anything that parents or schools did. If anything, they, they widen this. Um, so that I fear that uh, education inequality is likely to increase, particularly along this dimension in the future. And, Politically, that probably means we do need binding distance teaching concepts. I mean, that's particularly true for Germany, but things that are particularly geared uh, towards uh, low achievers, and that's probably a hard task, but something we actually have to implement if we want to uh, make sure that inequality is not uh, going to be bigger and bigger in the future. All right, uh, thanks for, for your attention, um, and, and I hope we can have a couple of minutes for a little bit of a discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ludger. That's a, a, a very uh, interesting presentation. Um, and we you've left us time for um, a few questions. So th thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, we'd one, um, I noticed one comment come in and I, I wonder, would you like to maybe say whether you think it applies to your um, sample or not. Just this uh, person says, I'm an educator and can speak to a possible reason why teachers spent more time with high achievers than low achievers. The possible reason is establishing contact. I found that students who were less engaged in learning often didn't answer the phone or would miss Zoom appointments. 
<laughs> would you say, I mean, is, is that something that you can speak to in terms of your um, um, findings? Right. No, that's a very good point. So I, I think um, that, that may well be the case. That may be what's behind there. We, we certainly don't know it. Although, actually, I don't think it's so much an issue during the time that we are looking at, because there were basically no Zoom meetings at the time. So we like it's actually it was forbidden in German schools to use Zoom because of data protection issues and so on. So even schools who, that, that wanted to use it weren't allowed to use it. So in the end, they were back to traditional means, and that was usually trying to call them and so on. So it may well be that teachers tried to call different kids and then actually some just didn't answer the phone and that will be part of what we're seeing there. I totally agree. But I think a big time, if you just look at the level, I mean, even among the high achievers, the contact rate is very low. Um, so as I indicated, it could be supply or demand. So it could come from the teachers or from the kids. And it's probably this difference is likely mostly coming from the kids. Teachers can reach them or the high achieving kids are more likely to try to get into contact so their parents would send an email to the parents saying like, my kid didn't quite understand that, could you explain? And then they may take up the phone. Uh, so I, I think part like a big chunk of that could come from, from what you suggest. Okay, th th thank you very much. Um, so for, from my point of view, I was wondering, could you say um, something about any possible age differences? I mean, maybe I missed some of that in some of your slides, but your sample covered a, a fairly significant age range from kind of, youngish kids who would um you know not be as independent and not be as likely to spend all their time gaming uh, what were your findings there right right i didn't get into that at all uh, we have a slide there but i i spare you this, all the details so what we do see like if you split it between whatever the the primary school kids in germany like the first four years in school and then the older ones uh, there are real differences and it's the case that actually the younger ones, the decline in school to learning time is less, but that's really because they like didn't go spend so much time in school before to begin with, and then they reduced to the same amount. Um, and for them, the, the increase is actually more in these like like they do more exercise uh, stuff like that, physical exercise type of things. The young kids, and the young kids have much lower levels of computer gaming, for example, and also the increase is lower. So it's really much of that is, is driven by the older kids. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, at the moment, I don't have any other questions. Orla, do you have a question? Apologies. Yeah, if you don't mind, maybe if we have time for one more. Um, thank you, Ludger. That was really, really interesting. Um, it, was, it was excellent. I just have one question about the what do you think are is going to be the long-term consequences of this? Um, I guess this is something that a lot of people are asking. You know, most children now around the world have lost months of schooling. Um, do you think it's going to increase the socioeconomic gap in learning? And will you have an opportunity to go back to these same children next year or two years in the future, let's say, and look at whether it's had a long-term impact on their test scores? Yeah, unless we're not going to be able to do that. This is a, the, the sampling and stuff doesn't allow us to, to get back to them. This is really hard in Germany. You actually have to ask them whether you're allowed to get back in contact with them. Actually, I think we did that, but I, I'm, this is probably uh, in, in vain because it's a surveying firm who has all that. So I, I, it would have been great, but it's uh, we're not going to be able to link it. I do fear that this, what we're going to see in the future is then that the low achievers are going to be struggling more and more. They probably are more likely to repeat the grades. This is kind of the easy way out for the German school system. Um, and um, well, as an economist, I, I mean, we know how important like these things you learn in school are in, in the real world afterwards to get a decent job to, to earn a living. And I mean, we've done projections of what, what the likely loss in learning that we've seen would mean for future income. And it's actually quite a big deal. I mean, I do think that like, like learning a third of a year's of average school learning uh, on average based on like many studies that we have it in the past is gonna be related to 3% lower income uh, over your entire working life. So these things are gonna matter for, for the people and giving these results, it's uh, gonna be particularly hard for the ones who anyway are not gonna be doing so well uh, later on. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, Luger, thank you very much indeed for a really uh, fascinating presentation and a really um, 
amazing insight into uh, some of the factors that are um, influencing it. I, I have to, uh, you know, even the, the gender differences themselves are worthy of, of um, further thought and um, investigation. So thank you very much indeed. And as usual, I'm very, so disappointed that you're not going to be able to follow up on this group. It would just seem such a, an obvious and, and useful thing to be able to do. But thank you very much indeed for your uh, contribution.